fires historically were par are part of the landscape and they're important for the establishment. But the fires that we have today are of such high severity and such increasing acreage that what's happening is a low severity fire goes through, it burns the middle of the tree and it, and it's sort of think a creme brulee across the ground, right? There's a little ash cap, mm -hmm. but all the seeds that are in the soil are in sort of like that, the happy and gooey, you know, yellow gooey bits. High severity fire goes through, it burns several inches down into the soil. And so that's a lot of those big black clouds. That's, mm -hmm. that's carbon that's coming up out of the soil. That's the organic top layer. And that's also the seeds, but it used to be like nine times out of 10 forest burns, forest regrows. Now it's starting to slip to like six times out of 10, four times out of 10. And, you know, you combine that with the fact that the 10 year rolling average of what, you know, how many acres burn in the U S in the eighties and the nineties, it was 2 million acres plus now it's 7 million acres plus. And that additional 5 million acres is about the size of New Jersey. Hello, hello. How now, goes it? I'm thinking your name is is like Cary Grant, and then I like <laughs> you know, you've you've reversed imposed them. Thanks for joining. So, Grant, how did you how did you think of this idea? I mean, you grew, you must have grown up as an environmentalist, and then you know, but what brought you to this idea? And just say a little bit about what the idea is. Sure. Yeah. You know, I'm the CEO and president of Drone Seed and then Silva Seed as well. So they're two separate businesses. Silva Seed is a 130-year-old seed and seedling company. And then Drone Seed reforests utilizing heavy lift drone swarms and develops carbon offsets, high quality carbon removal uh, utilizing trees. So we we sell those to companies making carbon negative or, or neutral pledges. And so, yeah, how did I get started? There's two stories there. One is on just where my background comes from. And then there's the company itself. And where, where I come from, everything I've done has been in sustainability. Mm -hmm. So Vestas Wind Energy, they paid me to work in China, Denmark, the US, install wind turbines, assist with projects on that. And then very non-traditionally in Bogota, Colombia, uh, built a company over nine years that was then acquired by a Canadian company, taking food waste, feeding it to insects, aka maggots, and then uh, utilizing that for industrial fish feed. So I have this esteemed honor of being a, a, a maggot entrepreneur <laughs> and did that specifically because we are, we're overfishing the small species that are used as protein in fish food and wanted to utilize food waste to be able to then create a more sustainable source to expand the food supply. You know, leaving that company wanted to make a much bigger impact on specifically carbon in the atmosphere. So I, I worked through a lot of really bad ideas and I know they were bad ideas because people told me they were bad ideas. They didn't want to pay for that. They didn't want that product in their lives. They don't spend five years of my life on that. And so, yeah, so I was complaining about that to a friend. We were discussing it. And, <laughs> um, and so he, he said, well, I guess you'll, you'll plant trees. And so I started, I'd been part of a very large tree planting project in the Northeast of Columbia as part of my master's program based on a 20 year UN pilot project. Can we, could we scale up that project and do something around the size of Denali National Park in Alaska, which is massive, mm -hmm. require 20,000 people. So we were figuring out if we could do that. That project didn't go forward, but out of that, I got a lot of knowledge in that space. And so, so I started looking into like, who could I call in the, in the industry and figure out what had been, what had been done in the past? What, what, what were the pain points? Um, so we very much stand on the shoulders of giants in that a lot of people put a lot of effort in how do you do reforestation or silviculture? Mm -hmm. And so started, you know, having those discussions, talking with them, figuring out, and what, you know, the, one of some of the big pain points were recruiting the labor in the people who plant trees are, are superheroes in that, you know, an average tree planter, and we've got the white papers to prove it. They burn the caloric equivalent of running two marathons every right. day. Right. So that's some of the, like, that's, that's where we got started and drones fly. So they navigate terrain. So you, you're you're there. You're going well. Okay, people run two marathons a day to replant the trees or to plant trees. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you make the leap to? Well, wait a second. That's too much energy being expended to do the job. I'm going to do it this other way. You know, how do you get to the drones? Yeah, I was, was very specifically looking at well, like what's the pain point? Well, we got to recruit people to do this, and we got to keep them doing this. Mm -hmm. And so when people get tired, they generally want to stop doing things. And so specifically within you know Canada, for example, their planting season for a lot of temperate conifer falls in the summer. So a lot of college kids do that, and you can see a number of the reports about just how hard it is. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's hard because there's terrain. There's people doing wind sprints up and down mountains, carrying 40 pound loads of trees. Mm -hmm. Well, drones fly. They can navigate that terrain a lot faster. So that's, that's, that's where we get some of that automation. But where do you, where does it occur to you? I'm going to use a drone and then you must need really industrial strength drones because they're going to fire the seed into the ground. So do you go to MIT and look at drone stuff? Like when you start to do this exploration of the drones, where, how does it come about and where do you go? Well, so again, talking to people like what's been tried in the past in the 70s, you know, there were trials of like tree machine guns or C-17 <laughs> sort of bombing trees. Wait, wait, wait. You what's could think it kind of like- machine gun? Yeah, what what's a tree machine gun? What is that? Um, there, there were prototypes in the 70s of some kind of mechanism. I'm not sure what the, the propulsion mechanism was, but to like shoot a tree seedling grown in a nursery into the ground. And so you mentioned, do we shoot it? We don't shoot anything. We drop. Yes, we use a heavy lift drone. It's about eight feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. It carries a 57 pound payload. Okay. And we just drop it because we put a seed inside of something about the size of a hockey puck. And that the whole purpose of that vessel is to reduce the predation, you know, squirrels, birds, other things, and to absorb moisture and help the seed not dry out. Those are the two things that'll kill a seed getting eaten or not having enough water. Does that mean that it's like you got this idea you want to drop things like, okay, we can only do this after it's rained or do circumstances have to be right in order to drop the seeds? No, not, not if we do our job well with the seed vessel. We look to biomimicry. We look to nature. How does nature do it? Well, nature sends out, like with temperate conifer, you have the cones. And if you look at a closed up cone, it's got all the seeds inside it. So it just, you know, nature just drops it. And then it just puts enough across the landscape that then there's seed availability and um, the seed knows when it's time to do its thing. First thing is to go, okay, biomimicry. I'm going to figure out how seeds go from the top of the plants, you know, from the top of the trees down to the ground? And you're, how could we do this? You know, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's more of my master's program I actually focused a lot on was biomimicry and a lot of the systems that had been utilized that say, hey, how can we combine what humans are looking for with what nature's already designed or built as far as a system. And some of the, those systems have evolved through eons of R&D. So they're going to be very efficient. And so how do, we, uh, how do we utilize them? And so from our perspective, we looked at it as, a, as very much like, what does a seed need and what can we help provide that seed? And so that's where we, pat, we, we put it into that vessel. And that's where that retention of moisture and then protection from predation comes in. And so we, you know, we don't disclose most of the ingredients, but we disclose one of them, um, which is super spicy pepper. Um, so squirrels why? have the same reaction. Pepper? Right. But why pepper? Because the dogs uh, they have the, the same reactions you or I would. Yeah. Wow. Wait, come I'm across sorry. the counter in the kitchen in the common room of someplace and Wait. there's a super spicy thing and you eat it and you're like, oh, oh, no, no, that. I'm not yeah. going to eat more of that. Eat the animals from eating the seeds, correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay. So that's how I can get rid of the squirrels in my yard. That <laughs> oh, <I can> wow. <laughs> That's how you might be able to get them to stop eating a thing. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So you have this idea, you get this drone out there, you think the idea is going to work. You know, how do you decide how many seeds, seedlings would go in a, an acre of land or, or some determined, you know, amount? How do you figure that out? I mean, what we do is we, we do controlled designed experiments around how do we adapt to different landscapes, more arid ecosystems, wetter ecosystems, different predators. And then what we do is then publish on about a two-year lag into various scientific publications as far as like how we're, how we're coming at it and how we're doing the approach. Does it vary what kind of tree you can put in there? Yeah. And again, we look to utilize multiple species so polyculture. And the reason is that, you know, again, we have two businesses, we have drone seed and we have silver seed. Silver seed is collecting the seed and we've expanded to become the largest private seed bank in the West. And then we grow millions of, of trees, seedlings. And so then what we do is we have a customer, we combine the two, both the seedlings and the seed vessel because they have different advantages with predators and desiccation. That is then wrapped into one project, which generates the carbon offsets, which then companies pay for. And we utilize a third party to do the third party verification of how many tons are, are removed from the atmosphere, et cetera. But we utilize- From, from uh, growing the trees, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And forecasted out over the next hundred years. 
I have a quick question before we move on to something else, which is if you don't have the seed and an area has been hit, how do you think about, okay, I'll introduce something that it might be indigenous to the neighboring, you know, how careful do we have to be to not introduce a very, very foreign tree to that, which will then do further potential damage to the environment or not? How do you manage that part of it? Yeah, I mean, we, we get this question a lot, which is like, do we use native species, et cetera? And it, and it goes so much further than that. The seed that we collect, if, if you can kind of think for your listeners here, wherever you're living, if you're in the States, think about this sort of like what a county map looks like. Well, imagine that each one of those counties are sort of a zone or an eco or a watershed. And that's effectively what the Forest Service has done is sort of created like seed zones that sort of say, this is a seed zone and seed that are in this zone are more likely to survive. So if there's a wildfire that goes through, we have collected seed and we will try and utilize the seed that is the closest to that fire we possibly can. And so for a lot of people are like, why, why? Well, we talk, you know, people talk about like, there's laws of physics. This is like a guidance of biology, if you will, which is that like a dug fir tree that creates a seed on the coast at sea level is more adapted to grow better, have higher establishment rates, survival due to the salt in the air and the soil and the water, et cetera. You take that same dug fir and you try and put it in a place where there's a lot of dug fir is growing at, you know, say on a mountain, 5,000 feet of elevation or something like that. You're just gonna have a lot lower potential for survival and establishment there because there's a lot less oxygen and all that salt went away. And so the genetic evolution of that species has been eclipsed. And so we utilize, you know, one, so it goes much further than just like, yes, Doug fir is native to much farther beyond that into let's use eight different species. You know, let's use hemlock, let's use various pine, fir, others, put those into the mix. Why? Because the land managers just been affected by fire. The last thing they want is another fire. And so right. by having multiple species, each different species have different evolved mechanisms to deal with fire. So, you know, for engineers out there, it's redundancy. We have different types of trees with different types of systems to deal with fire. So we're more likely to have survival after a fire. So that's good. So that's why the polyculture, and then we use it much more with a, with a very local seed source so that we get the highest probability of establishment. You know, used to be that college kids would come out and plant the trees. What is the efficiency of the drone planting the trees? Like it used to take uh, six months to plant an area. Now you do with the drone, you could do it in how long? I mean, I have the worst answer for, for this, like many things, because we work on a lot of different landscapes with some are flat, some are mountains, some have arid, some are wet. And so, you know, it depends. However, as sort of a general answer, you can say, you know, we're about six times faster than the average tree planter as far as dropping with the drones. Now, you know, to the earlier point, though, we utilize both because they have different methods in which they are able to survive predation and desiccation or drying out. You use both in that you have people planting by hand and you have the drones? Correct. We utilize both. The drones go first. They're sort of like baseball fans out there, the opening pitcher. And then the closing pitcher is the reforestation with seed links. That is because the number one thing that we want for a land owner or land manager is to be able to restore that forest for carbon removal. Now, when you plant it, like it, we're going to go out there on Wednesday, we're going to plant the thing, right? Do you keep planting over the same place so that like, it's like, okay, we plant it now, come back in three months, we plant it again, we plant, you know, do you, how do you bring the forest back? You know, is it one thing you just spray it all out there or is it like you got to do it in shifts? Yeah, I can speak to the how the drone process works, and then we follow up and cover the same acreage in the same way that we would with tree planters. The drones, what we do is, you know, first step, there's three steps. Go out there, take a survey of the area. It's mountainous, it's got rocky crags, it's got maybe some trees that have been left up after the fire. So we utilize LIDAR and multispectral imaging to create a 3D terrain map of the environment. So the drones are not flown by an operator saying, okay, we're going to go over here, go over there. You do LIDAR of the whole thing so that you understand where everything is. And then you just, it just does it automatically itself. It does, you take the telemetry of the distance and everything, and it just, it just does it. Yeah. So that's the first step. So there's a, there's a much smaller drone than our eight foot drone that is carrying a LIDAR unit and multi-spectral camera, and it flies a survey pattern. 
So the second step in the process, you've got the LIDAR, you've got the multispectral. We then remove the areas where trees are not going to grow well from the areas that we're going to fly. So, I mean, these would be very obvious to us, but for a computer, we remove out at about a third of an acre scale. So like, don't drop the seed vessels in ponds. They're not going to grow there. Don't drop them on gravel roads. Mm -hmm. If there's big rock outcroppings, if right. there's for any reason, any vegetation, like big blackberry bushes or other things that it's clear it's not going to grow, we remove all of that. And then the third step in the process is we come out to site. The drones have the pre-programmed flight paths, two trucks, two trailers, six aircraft. Depending upon the landing location, we'll fly anywhere from two to five at a time. And then we'll go out and they'll fly these areas and then they'll come back and land. And then it's like a NASCAR pit crew, like swap out the batteries, swap out the seed vessels, get them back up in the air. And that's really important for the costs of the project to be very fast in that way. And if the pilot sees something or hears something that they don't like, they can take control of any of the aircraft. And there's, there's a computer operator as well that can pause all the aircraft in the air, send them back one by one to land, do various things. But um, that happens very rarely. Let me ask you a question. Let's say an acre. What, what is the sort of from beginning to end? What, what's the time frame? You know, good tree planter does two acres a day and we're about six times faster than that most of the time. So that gives you an idea of the, the sort of acreage. You do that with the, do the, the actual planters come the same day or do they come the next day? So the planters will come actually significantly later. Okay. You know, as much as a year later, because it takes uh, okay. time to put the seeds into the nursery mm -hmm. and then grow them. And so what the advantage is, is if we can get there right after a fire, we can get seed down on that landscape immediately before other, you know, th sort of think any abandoned lot or a vacant mm -hmm. lot that you're aware of, like stuff grows, nature doesn't do vacuums. And so getting that seed vessel down before other competitive species that would compete for light, et cetera, um, that's important for the trees establishment. I mean, they're going to be competitive species no matter what, right? You can't take them all out and seeds will blow, seeds that are not your seeds will blow in at some point. So do you have, does that, does that mean that tree uh, planters have to go through and pull things they think are wrong or do they just let that all go? No, the, the, the goal is to have the trees be a, a taller height. If they can get access to light, they'll mm -hmm. eventually outgrow the grasses and shade them out, right? And so then it's just, can you give them that head start so that they'll start before and get enough growth before the, the grasses or other things would shade them out? So when you're out there and you're running this stuff, do you feel like, because you're not in a forest yet, but do you feel like you're rebuilding the forest? In the moment, can you feel you feel a connection to nature while you're out there doing that? Um, let me think about that for a second. I mean, yes. I, I guess the reason I pause here is because we're at burn sites. Mm -hmm. And so burn sites, the most common thing that people say when they're out there is like, this looks like shot of the moon. It doesn't feel alive at the time. Now, fires historically were par are part of the landscape and they're important for the establishment, but the fires that we have today are of such high severity and such increasing acreage that what's happening is a low severity fire goes through, it burns the middle of the tree and it and it's sort of think a creme brulee across the ground, right? There's a little ash cap, mm -hmm. but all the seeds that are in the soil are in sort of like that, the happy and gooey, you know, yellow gooey bits. High severity fire goes through, it burns several inches down into the soil. And so that's a lot of those big black clouds. That's, mm -hmm. that's carbon that's coming up out of the soil. That's the organic top layer. And that's also the seeds. And then it's also burning all the way up to the tops of the trees. Mm -hmm. And so that's where historically in low severity fires, cones would be stored and then they would seed rain down after they opened up and then the forest would sort of re regenerate after that. So what's coming, what's happening is the high severity fires, it takes a long time to acquire data sets in forestry, but mm -hmm. we're starting to see American Forest, Forest Service, others starting to publish different results for different ecosystems. But it used to be like nine times out of 10, forest burns, forest regrows. Now it's starting to slip to like six times out of 10, four times out of 10. And you know, you combine that with the fact that the 10 year rolling average of what, you know, how many acres burn in the US in the 80s and the 90s, it was 2 million acres plus. Now it's 7 million acres plus. And that additional 5 million acres is about the size of New Jersey. So that is a very, very big acreage. I mean, another way to say that is like, it's about five warehousers worth of reforestation a year. For those who are not aware, warehousers 
the biggest timber company in the U.S. by several factors by by land managed. So that's kind of the shift that we're seeing. And so 2018 was brutal. 2020, 2021 were brut- was brutal. So if you're a land manager, tribal nation, forest service, it used to be that, okay, well, maybe it's not the seed that I want coming from an orchard that's been sort of old school bred to be the fastest, tallest, straightest tree but nature will take care of it. They'll get some, we'll get forest coming back. Now it's much more of like, oh, well, what's going to happen here? And we end up with 10 foot tall bush or a a persistent early seral phase. That's not great for carbon removal, garbage sinks and storage. And in fact, in many cases, if invasive species come in, they're not adapted to the long dry seasons. They have much more of a spray and pray methodology. So they're more likely to burn. So they're more likely to start the next wildfire if you've got scotch broom or Himalayan blackberry or other things. You know, um, these fires are different than they've been before. You know, they're, they tend to be bigger. They're not the usual forest fires we've seen in the past. Now, some of that might be attributable to just not having burned for a long time. So there's a lot of fuel in the forest. But my question, I guess, is, well, one, do you think that's true that there's just a lot of, a lot of fuel in the forest? And then two, the question would be, now that environment is changing, do we need to think about the trees that would best survive in, in this environment? Do we have to regrow these forests in a different way to, to try and get to the same place? Yeah, the density affects fires. That is a, a known issue. But I, I want to make sure it's not taken away from, this is very much a climate change story. Similar to reefs, similar to glaciers, people pattern match this really quickly, which is forests are burning much more significantly. And the causes of that are also that the dry period is much longer. And so if anybody's ever tried to start a fire, they know that it's much easier to do so with dry wood than wet wood. And especially if you put put wood in a kiln or otherwise, like then it really goes up, right? Well, you think about the summer season, you know, used to be much more compressed and the more it starts to expand between, it's not just sort of your like very stereotypical, like June, July and August. I don't know where, where listeners are listening from, but now it's, it's also May, June, July, August, September. And then it's April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Well, that you you basically have a very long period of time in which wood is just drying out, drying out, drying out. And not just the trees, but the stuff that's on the ground, the dead woody biomass. So then you correlate that with more heat. There's been a number of papers starting to correlate that with increased lightning strikes. So lightning, one of the two main causes of fires next to, you know, humans uh, being out in the wilderness. You start to put all that together and you're like, yes, we have climate change causing much drier forests. Yes, we could do more about having less density in the forest, but also there, you know, this is climate change, uh, very much so. Well, it's incredible. You built an incredible business. Uh, Are you optimistic for the future? I mean, you know, do you think we're actually going to be able to um, return the temperature of the forest to where it was 20 years ago, or can we keep it where it is now? Or what do you think? Um, I have... Well, this is gonna this is gonna be a sweet and sour candy to use another terrible metaphor. Even, you know, thought experiment. Even if humans were gone tomorrow, for you know whatever reason, yeah, yeah, we would still undergo all of the effects of climate change because we've already pumped so much carbon in the atmosphere. So uh, we have to mitigate, and we have to electrify everything. And trees are not a silver bullet for that, but we are definitely a big part of the solution that's scalable today with high quality carbon removal. So you know, my goals in communicating to the to folks such as yourselves and the public is that like offsets are a valuable tool in that they are a tool they are you know similar to dollars or currency yes they can be used for criminal activities but they can also be used for humanitarian aid and so offsets are similar they are you know how they are used is important and so what but what we are doing with those offsets is we are measuring and what gets measured gets done we are measuring the removals of carbon out of the atmosphere utilizing trees and contributing those removals to all of the other solutions and it is very much an all hands on deck situation i think it is very important to point to the bright, shiny solar punk future we can have. But that only comes with how we vote, how our policies are enacted, do we decarbonize everything? And I think, so my guideposts are very much less around shame or fear. I don't wanna trigger a fight or flight response Mm -hmm. to people. I think we can look to brands like Tesla, brands like Rivian, brands that are out there 
of like, this is the cool future that we can have. You could have an EV where you don't have to get penalized for driving, you know, a dork mobile. You could have an EV that goes zero to 60 faster than the vast majority of $200,000 plus sports cars. Right. And it's fuel is electric, which is local jobs. It's not oil and gas. It is not fueling political regimes that nobody agrees with. Yeah. And so that is something that's very powerful. And you combine both of those things. That is the, the bright future that we, that we can have and aspire to. We can have leather from mushrooms. We can have passenger ships that are similar to those hydrofoil racing yachts. And I'm alluding to Ministry for the Future, which is a great book that points to this solar punk future where you know, you're on a hydrofoil racing yacht as a passenger ship instead of a plane going between the US and Europe. Like you, we can have blimps, which who doesn't want to go on a blimp ride? Like these are options in our future that we can have if we make smart choices. And then there's also way more practical things like how do we regulate our grid? Where does our power come from, et cetera. But that those are also end up in really practical things, which is we don't have people choking from asthma. We don't have people in, you know, impacted in communities in such negative ways. So I'm very optimistic about how many people are now focusing their time on this. And so for people who are interested in doing that and transitioning their careers, whether they're accountants or marketing or legal or whatnot, you do not need to be a chemistry or physics expert to work on this. There are so many companies compared to 2016 when we got started that are focusing on climate. People can look to my climate journey, People can look to climate base. These are organizations that are helping people find opportunities within climate. So they can spend not just their sort of like volunteer time working on this, but they can get paid full time as a job, as a part of a company like ours or others to go out and do good things and make that big, bright, shiny future. So that's my, that's my rant. That's my soapbox. Great. Well, thank you. This has been uh, fantastic. And we really appreciate you coming on the, the, the podcast, you know, Priscilla. Yeah. yeah. Well, and thank you for helping us amplify. Yeah. 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 No, it's thank you. And it's particularly your last, you know, the last point, right? There is a way to kind of rethink this. I'll, I'll leave you with one thought. A friend of mine who's no longer alive, Doug Tompkins. I don't know, you know, he was involved in, in Patagonia and preserving some of that land. And we were talking once and he said, I'm going to put the land into a trust because he bought like a third of Patagonia to put it in a land trust. So I'm like, okay, is this a hundred year land trust? And he looked at me and was like, no, 10,000 years. In <laughs> other words, what is necessary, what you're doing is accelerating. But the point is, you know, I like to think that maybe what you're, that work you're doing can, can take root, not to make a, another bad pun, um, I appreciate it being on roots, not on seed. So <laughs> like gold star. Yeah. <laughs> and flourish. Yeah. For us. So anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you yeah. guys. Thank you. Very much. Thank you both. Okay. Bye you guys. Bye.